Our guest for this session is Ivana Kearns, Senior Vice President of Marketing at Pluralsight, a technology workforce development company. She is responsible for driving Pluralsight's EMEA demand gen and field marketing campaigns. Prior to Pluralsight, Ivana was VP of Global Field Marketing and ABM at Datastax. She also worked at TIPCO, where she ran the EMEA marketing division. Ivana has previously been nominated for the BlackBerry Women in Technology Awards and the Stevie Awards for Women in Business. She is also a best-selling author of the book Rent, The Secret World of Male Prostitution in Dublin. Ivana, welcome to the Mindset Shift and it's great to have you on the program. Oh, well, it's great to be here, Tim. Thanks for having me. What we like to do in the Mindset Shift is to find out about the person and find out, you know, about their background and things like that before we get into talk about business. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm from County Sligo um, and I uh, was born and reared here, spent a lot of time in Dublin. Uh, I was over 14 years in Dublin between university and, and, and work. And the first opportunity I got, I moved back home to Sligo, believe it or not. So my career is very much built on remote working. Um, and I've, for most of my career, with the exception of my journalist career, which was uh, mostly based in Dublin, other than that, I've been working for American companies um, and literally flying around the world. Um, and that came to an abrupt stop, as you can imagine, in March of 2020. Um, but that's been my life for uh, probably the last 15 to 20 years. So tell, t- let's go back to Sligo and, and your, your first stint in Sligo, your, your upbringing. So tell me about your family and, and the circumstances, uh, siblings, parents, etc. Yeah, so I come from a very staunch Gaelic background. Uh, my father, Mickey Cairns, played for Sligo, um, and he was quite a star in his day. So, so Ivana, just to jump in, I know Mick, of Mickey Cairns, okay, because I'd be a big sports fan. <laughs> and so, okay, so he definitely was a big star in Sligo, oh. even though many people watching this will say, well, Sligo were never really big. I right. can just promise you guys. Even though Sligo may not have been big, Mickey Cairns was really big. <laughs> yeah, they describe him as probably the best footballer never to win in all Ireland, as hard as he tried. But yeah, he was a big influence in my life. Uh, you know, he he trained hard. You know, he was a very uh, he was very into his uh, his uh, footballing career and his health and and all of that in those earlier years. Um, once he kind of finished up his football, he kind of hung up his boots uh, and put on a bit of a belly. But he did get back into better shape in more recent years with our influence. But yeah, we grew up very much with Gaelic at the centre of the household, and you know, mum just facilitated everything you know with us you know she more or less kept us out of his way when it was coming up to a big game and we were always at those games and the energy that came with that was something that stayed with me and still stays with me today I just love that atmosphere I love that energy and drive I love the sound of the crowd uh, and the joyous occasion you know those big match games doesn't matter if Sligo's playing or not even if it's Dublin and Kerry, and it is Dublin a lot these days, uh, you know, we enjoy those games as a family now, uh, just as much as we would have enjoyed Sligo when they were doing a little bit better than they are now, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I have uh, two, two brothers uh, and one sister. Um, the brothers tried very much to follow in dad's footsteps in the football, but were just not quite as good as he was. Um, but, yeah, we were sort of brought up to be the best that you can be you know, and to really put your mind to something and then go for it, you know, and, and, you know, we always had that mindset of you can be whatever you want to be. And as long as you put in the graft, you can get there. And so I took that with me into my career. And, you know, I firmly believe in that, you know, if you put your mind to something, put in the work, you can get there. And, and par- a big part of that is the positive mindset. And I would say, you know, the positive mindset came very much from my dad. He is very much a, you know, the cup is half full always, always looking for, you know, the silver lining in everything. And and mom is pretty much the same. So, you know, that has kind of ingrained itself in us. And uh, I bring that into my own mindset every single day uh, and how I view things and how I view challenges as they come up and how I work through them. I think a lot of that came from my upbringing and, and my parents and, and how they reared us. So what was it like you know, to be 
growing up in a house as a child where your father was a star, he's a star with his local club, he's a star with his county. And as you said, he's deemed to be one of the player, one of the best players ever, never to have won in our own. So he's a real star. And in an Irish context in GA, that makes you a superstar. So yeah. but as as a as a child in, in that environment, you know, I mean, you talk about being the best you can be, about working hard and those things. And we'll get back to some of those later mm. on. But just I, I'm always fascinated by by people who have grown up where their parents were superstars yeah. and how they had to deal with that. Yeah. To be honest, you know, I was always super proud. Um, and there was a little part of me that wanted some of that, believe it or not. Um, you know, and, and, and I always grew up wanting some level of recognition, you know, be it in my career or, or in some other facet. And I was never the sporty type, so it wasn't going to be in that side of my life. So, you know, and, and I think, you know, seeing, you know, the way people looked at my father and the way they revered him, particularly in GAA circles, you know, I, I, I just, uh, the pride I used to feel, you know, when you would see people's faces, and, you know, they just wanted to talk to him or, you know, have a, a short conversation and understand, you know, how he felt when he was playing and how did he train and how, you know, how was he so good right and left foot and all of that. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that drove me, you know, in the sense of I wanted a piece of it in some some way, shape or form in my life. I wanted that recognition and I wanted others to look at me the way that they looked at him. Um, and that's, that's, very interesting. that's very interesting now, Ivana, uh, because, as you said, you know, from the sporting front, it wasn't really, you know, you weren't hip hop at that, we'd say. Yeah. But you wanted recognition. And that's hard. Because first of all, your dad yeah. is getting all the recognition in, in the context. Your mom strikes me as a lady who was so supportive of, an, of him in the totally. background. Yeah. Would, would, so, you know, it's sort of the wind beneath my wings type uh, approach is what comes to mind. Yes, in, in that context. But uh, as a teenager, how do you get that recognition? What, like, so because you know, in Ireland, not just saying it's Sligo, kind of not easy to get that. <laughs> That's very true. And you know, I I copped on early on that it was going to be academically for me. Um, and so because I, I started to see, you know, that I was doing pretty well in school, and you know, I could be the best in my class. So that was always my aim. So what you'll find if you look back over my academic history is I would want to be the number one. And it was always the number one. So, you know, I, I, I think I got the second highest leave insert in my in my secondary school, was a bit peeved at the second place. Um, but then when I went into university, I had a first place in my um, degree and a first place in my master's, one one degrees in both. And that was the kind of recognition that I was going for because, you know, dad, you know, never went to university, mom never went to university. And so, you know, I got the recognition through that almost not only, you know, their approval and, and, and their support, but we have, we come from a big family. My father has a big family. My mom has a pretty big family and, you know, aunts, uncles, you know, grandparents, all of them, you know, started to hone in on my career and where I would go with my career following all of these achievements. So, you know, firstly, I went into journalism and worked with Today FM. Um, and it was around that time that I published the book. So I published a book on uh, Rent Boys, which was a piece of investigative journalism. It was based on a thesis I had done in the Masters in Journalism, and then I rewrote it into a book. And so that became, that was published, and then it became a bestseller. It was on the bestseller list in Dublin, a renaissance for about three weeks. And so, you know, it was always striving to, you know, more, more, more. And I loved what came with the broadcast journalism. You know, there was that little level of, you know, recognition because people knew who you were because they heard your voice on the radio and they got to know your name and, and things like that. So I got my own little bit of and it was very small on, on the scale of dad's recognition, but I did get some of it and, and, and I loved it when I had it. So let me take you back to your leaving, Certo, because you made a point that you came second. And I, I'm fascinated by the fact of being the best you can be and be number one are not necessarily the same thing. So right. I'll, tease, I'll tease that out to you later on because they're, they're not the same thing. You can be the best you can be and end up number 40. So right. that's just what you are and that's it. Right, right. But being second in the leaving cert. So for you, you it, it was obvious that it was a big disappointment. So I'm very interested to see how you dealt with that. Yeah. Because you were striving 
to to be the best you can be. And at that point in time was to be number one, which you identify with being the best you can be. Yep. So you, you you have your disappointment. There's no doubt you have your parents' disappointment because you know, like you know, Mickey Kern's daughter and you know, you're you're the pride of the family. So there's all this stuff going on in that. How did you deal? Because that's a big disappointment at such an yeah. early age. Yeah. And later on in college, we get to that journalism journey. But how did you deal with it? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and I would say my mom probably helped me deal with that the most. Um, because I remember coming back on and, you know, oh, it was second. And, and she was saying, but look at what you got. You know, you can take your pick now in terms of where you want to go in university. You know, you have the world at your feet. You're really going to hone in on the fact that you were second. You know, you now get to choose where you go and you take this forward. You know, and she kind of downplayed it and said, you're looking at this all wrong. You know, this is the start of your life, the start of your career. Where you came first, second, third, fourth really doesn't matter because you now will take this forward and shape your own path. You know, and and I sort of, even though, apologies, even though it was, you know, a bit of a blow at the time, I did sort of leave it there, you know, and I didn't, you know, dwell on it too long. And, you know, I remember my sister, who would be a, a big force in my life, saying, you know, I, I, I don't know where I came in my class and you're worried about, you know, second. She's like, in all the things you can worry about, is that really it? Is that what you're going to, you know, uh, you know, spend energy worrying about? And, you know, when, when people spoke to me about it like that, I was kind of like, oh, they're right, you know. I did really well. I have to get on with that now and, and, and decide where I'm going with my career. And I kind of picked myself up and, and away I went, you know. It's, it's fascinating the fact that your mom was the person that sort of made you look at it from a different lens. You know, yeah. in, in the modern world, we'd say she made you pivot, but really she, all she was doing was giving you support and saying, look, hang on yeah. a second here, Ivana. You've yeah. done exactly well. Whatever you've finished, You've done really well. So, yes. you know, focus on the future. And I think that's something that even in business today, when I talk to clients, I talk to business and organizations frequently, I make the point, why do we always dwell on the negative? Why do we always yeah. dwell on what went wrong? Why don't we spend time on what went right yeah. as well as what went wrong in a balanced right. way Because I, and just move forward? Because we can't change us today. We, you know, right. we, we can improve tomorrow and do our best today. So it's interesting that was your mom and then your sister also in addition to that gave you that yeah. support. where did you come into family you have two brothers i'm the baby yeah okay so therefore yeah. you see being the baby my i'm the middle child of five so i always felt that i had a brother and sister older and a sister and brother younger so i was boy girl boy girl boy so right. i always felt that the older two boys and girls um got everything as everybody else and then the younger two were the baby so i definitely suffer from middle child syndrome but the babies <laughs> in my family would say no you had everything in front of us. So how did you find being the baby? Yeah, I, I actually liked being the baby. Again, you know, I, I suppose I am a bit of an attention seeker. So, you know, I got it in that in coming last in the family. So and I think that was a you know big thing for me, that that sort of attention. Um, and I think also the way I looked at it was, you know, they sort of set the way for me. You know, so and, and the way I did it was, you know, when when the oldest boy did his leave insert, I was kind of taking note. Then the next guy did his and then my sister did hers, which was a big one. I was like, OK, let's see how she does. But it was always with the intention of doing way better. And and I don't really know where that came from. You know, it was like, OK, I, I can I can beat Adrian's, you know, I can. Yeah, I can get past Carl's. And then it was like Valerie's. Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. But I think I can do this, you know. And, you know, I was always setting myself goals. So I'd see what they did and then, you know, go higher, go better. Um, and that was the way I looked at things for whatever reason. I just had to do better all the time. It's fascinating because, you know, um, you just made a point. You love being a baby. So ironically, you were last in the family. It was okay to be last in that sense. <laughs> yeah. you in all in perspective, Tim. All, that's uh, all in perspective. <laughs> Talk to me. You went then to be a journalist, right? And hmm. um, you made a point just earlier about the thesis, you know, w- was the foundation for the book Rent yes. when it talked about, yes. um, you know, male prostitution basically and, and, and rent boys in Dublin. Mm. How challenging was that? I mean, first of all, you know, you're just out of college. I know you have a master's, right? But yeah. you, you're just out of college yeah. and you're trying to get your feet in the journalistic world. And, yeah. and you write this book, which went on to be a bestseller and um, for a long period of time, a number of weeks, but also it's remained a very strong seller for a period of time. How did yeah. you do that? 
Yeah, you know, I think that whole period of my life was a strange one because when I was doing the research for the book, I think naivety, believe it or not, was my best friend. I had no idea what I was getting into when I started to research it. I was in very dangerous places, unbeknownst to myself. You know, Phoenix Park, one, two o'clock in the morning, um, going into, you know, uh, massage parlors and things like this that were in the, you know, the underworld of Dublin. And, you know, making a call outside to, you know, somebody in the class who, you know, knew me but didn't care too much for me to say, hey, if I don't ring you back in an hour, can you call my brother? You know, because I knew he was in Dublin and he was a guard. He's a guard. And I, you know, I, I would have these little out scenarios that, OK, if I do get into trouble, you know, your man, I'll ring my brother and, you know, we'll be OK. But in hindsight, it was madness what I did. Absolute madness but you know i think it was great you know it was a great learning curve of when maybe what not to do in the future but i think for me that was kind of like you know my stepping stone really into journalism it was like okay this is actually what the day to day could look like and i really did like it i thrived on on that i thrived on the unknown and finding out more about a world that i had no idea about no idea i mean this was Oh, unheard of stuff coming from County Sligo. You know, both the street side of it was, you know, fascinating. And then this off street underworld, which I'd never heard of before, you know, and getting into that, you know, I really relished it. I loved it. And, you know, I'm waiting for the day when I have time. And I know everybody talks about time, but I would love to write another book on a subject matter that's equally intriguing. I've yet to find that subject matter, but I will at some point in the future. I'm fascinated with, with the concept of, you know, this county Sligo girl in the big smoke yeah. for college is a big challenge anyway. Just take that out. Absolutely. It's, it's still, yeah. you know, you're, you're ringing somebody in, in, from your class who kind of might like you, kind of might not like you. Yeah. Um, you're expecting he'll stay awake all night and that if, he, if you don't hear from him in an hour, he'll stay awake for you. <laughs> For Matt. whatever reason you're expecting that, which is yeah. naive. When you look for it now, and then you know you expect that your brother, who's a guard, will yeah. get a phone call and will arrive all in the time to yeah. save me. To save me. Oh yeah, and it was that simple in my mind, you know. And I was dressing as a boy and going into the Phoenix Park because it was they had, were all males, so I needed to blend. And then eventually they would figure out, okay, this isn't a male. But I would have goodies for them. And I'd say, you know, I just want to chat. I just want to learn about you. You know, let me in, you know, and eventually they did. And they enjoyed seeing me coming. You know, I would hide if the cars were coming. I wasn't a threat. I wasn't taken away from their business. But I was a silent observer. And the things I observed were just unbelievable stuff. Some of it I couldn't put in the book uh, for many different reasons. People's identities were at stake and things like that. But it was just, it was beyond belief for me, this whole world. And, you know, I think for me, it was a, a real eye opener, you know, um, and the, I think my naivety left me in those period, in that, you know, six months of research. It was like, wow, this world is, is a horrible place, you know, and I'm not safe, you know, as I always thought I was in the realm of my family in Sligo, you know, and this is a whole new world. So, yeah, frightening in some ways. And let me just bring it back to your family then, because what did mom and dad think? Were they aware of the fact that you were, you know, that their their beautiful baby was out in the Phoenix? Oh, no idea. Dressed no. as a boy, you know. No in, idea. In horrifically challenging times for the people who were there. You know, yeah. you've got to think about the people who were there. And, you know, nobody should pass judgment on, you know, there for the grace of God, go yeah. any of us or any of our children. So, you know, you're in a really, really dangerous situation. Yeah. And, you know, Mickey and Mom are at home thinking, you know, yeah. my no, daughter's doing great. They were none the wiser. And in fact, nobody knew. You know, anybody that knew me well, nobody knew what I was doing. You know, I didn't tell my sister because I knew she'd worry. I didn't tell my parents. I told them all afterwards. And it was just like, what were you thinking? But that wasn't, I wasn't thinking about myself. I was thinking about the story. And I had to get to the bottom of it. I had to learn from these people themselves. I had to talk to them. I had to get into their world. And I was driven by that. You know, there was no thought around, I could get killed here. You know, I'm entering into a terrible situation. But that never crossed my mind. It's, it's just madness to think back on it. 
isn't it interesting though when you think about you know the business world you know sometimes we, sh- we need to keep focused on the outcome because what you did you focus on the outcome which in this case was the book that right. was the outcome for you right, right? right. and it's not for me to say, you know, you were correct or incorrect. That's, you know, you made a judgment call at that point. And, and thankfully, it all worked out well for you. Thank so, God, yes. You know, but it is it is fascinating, it's, you know, that the outcome was such an important aspect of it for you, yep. which it should be for many of us. Yep. You were so driven to achieve the goal. Yep. You you decided you had, I, I use a word when I talk to clients and, and organizations, you must pay the price. Yes. Whatever the price is, it demands. You must pay that to be successful. Yep. And if you're not going to pay the price, then you shouldn't do it. Because right. okay. And what you did for me, Ivana, in that journey to achieve success with the book, was well, to write the book and then achieve success later. You pay the price, and yeah. that to me is a big compliment I can give you. You pay the price. Yeah. But it was a big price. But mm-hmm. thanks, as you say, thanks for the God, you came through the other side of it. Yeah. Today. It worked out for sure, you know, and and I think one thing I did learn from that, Tim, in in my own sort of journey in business is you shouldn't focus just on the outcome. You have got to think about the journey, you know, on the route to the outcome, you know, and it's sometimes you can just hone in on I have to get to there, you know, and you don't think about all the things that need to happen in order to get you there. So I've had to work a little bit at that in, in, in terms of setting out the journey, not just the goal. Right. And then mapping how I get to the goal, right, or the outcome. And 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 that can be challenging because people just can, you know, think of the end game and not enjoy the journey. Now I would say in this case, I did enjoy the journey because I was, you know, every time I got more information, it would drive me up more, drive me onwards. You know, and I get closer to the what I believed was the truth. That was driving me. But again, I was really honing in on the outcome as opposed to the journey. It's a great point, Ivana, but in a, in a business sense, the outcome is is there. It's our, our goal, our ambition, you know, our KPI, whatever it is in any of our businesses. But we've got to assess all the factors along the way right. and along the journey. There are risks, and you've got to make sure that you're analyzing the risks at all points in time. Right. You made the point you went disguised as a boy, yep. and that was found out quickly because you know somebody it was never going to work. <laughs> And then you 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 bought some goodies, so you 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 made them feel that you weren't a threat to them, and as you say, you didn't interfere with their business. You yeah. just were you trying to find out their story and then relay the story uh, yep. in the best and professional way where you could later. Yeah, but we do have to look at all the factors of a journey in a business sense, which For includes sure. the the risks, which includes the you know the 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 outcome and yep. the price that the business and we individually have to pay. Absolutely, Is that a fair assessment. I think that's absolutely right. And you have to look at all of the steps along the way. I skipped all of those steps. You know, I just thought of, you know, what I needed out of it. And 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 I think now I look at things a lot differently, particularly in the business sense. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a meticulous planner um now. And and so when the goal is here, I work back from that and say, right, these are the things that need to happen. And I try to enjoy that journey of getting me to the target. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, very consciously trying to enjoy the journey. Um, and, you know, that's been interesting with COVID because, you know, that kind of threw a lot of things into disarray in, in, in different businesses. Um, you know, and, and I could have sat there and said, well, you know, it's going to be very hard to get to the targets that have been set for us in, in, in marketing at Plural Site because of all of these factors. You know, we can't do in-person events, life is very different and so on and so forth. But, you know, one of the things that I did was I kind of looked at it and I said, okay, targets are the targets. They're not gonna change. They're not gonna, they're not gonna bring them down just because we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm just gonna map out what I can do with what I have, even though we have all these restrictions. Let's see, you know, let's break it down bit by bit. Um, and that's what I did. And what was interesting too, you know, I was new. I joined Plural Site in March 2020. I had four days in the office before we went into complete shutdown, you know, and I hadn't met many people at that point. I never met my boss in person. I've never met the CEO in person. I've never been to Utah, which is where they're headquartered. So many factors were at play, which, you know, could have influenced my ability to reach the targets that were set for 2020. 
Um, but, you know, my, my mindset was more, okay, let's think about the team that I have. Let's think about, you know, yes, there's challenges, but, you know, let's think about how we get around each of those challenges individually. You know, like how do we pivot to virtual events? What will they look like that we can't do, you know, all of these, um, you know, in-person ones? How will we build a virtual strategy? Um, and we did. And, you know, I'm pleased to tell you that we met our targets in 2020 for marketing and, and, you know, I think a lot of that was to do with the mindset and the way in which, you know, my team and I approached it. So it, there I, is a lot of strength and positivity. I want to explore that more with you because that's really fundamental to what we're going to chat about is, you know, how you deal with a challenge. This is a COVID yeah. challenge that we're all going through in a pandemic. You you worked with Today FM. I just take it back. You yeah. worked with Today FM for a while, obviously, and, you know, and then you decided to, to give up the journalistic world, which I yeah. find fascinating. For somebody, yeah. you know, who's successful, as you were successful in your, yes. in your career, and you had written a book which was successful. Yes. And that's a huge pivot. And oh, it was that pivot to get you out of, as they'd say, I'm from Cork, so we get you out of Dodge and bring it back to the West? Uh, or was, was there other factors that kind of decided, yeah. I'm heading back down to the, to, the, to the West, and I'm going to, you know, get into the commercial world in a different way yeah it, it, partly i mean you know getting back to sligo was always a goal and i couldn't see a vision for that well i not a clear path to it because i was uh, on the board of directors of um, ocean fm uh, yes. which is which is here in sligo so that's a radio station but again a local radio station slightly different um so you know that was kind of in the back of my head that if i stayed in journalism potentially you know maybe we'd go down that route and and and, and do something with ocean However, it was more of an opportunity that came my way that, that caused the pivot from journalism to marketing. Um, and, and that was, and it was an, an individual who had a, an impact in my life at that time. Um, and I'll name him because I, he, he knows uh, the, the positive impact he's had. Uh, Fran Rooney, who was the CEO of Baltimore Technologies. You may remember the e-security firm that rose yeah. to, to great strength, but also had a very quick demise. Um, I was actually interviewing Fran Rooney uh, uh, in the business slot in Today FM, and he was in the studio with me and we were talking and he said, you know, what kind of uh, schooling or university uh, did you, you know, what course did you do? And we were talking about it. And I said, yeah, and I worked in, I had worked in the trade board, which is now Enterprise Ireland. I had done a little stint in PR. And he said, oh, so you know PR then? And I said, well, a little bit. I said, I studied it and I have two years of experience working in it for Enterprise Ireland. And he said, oh, that's interesting because I have an international PR manager positioning position just opening up in Baltimore and I'd love you to interview for it. And I thought to myself, oh, gosh, no, nothing about this business. But um, he said, could you come for an interview tomorrow at 8 a.m.? Uh, and we went, I went to the financial uh, services center, 8 a.m., and he took me through the role. And he also spoke about, you know, uh, how I would be compensated, which, by the way, overnight would have tripled my salary from today of him. So that was a, certainly attractive. But he also mentioned travel. And that I think that was what caught, got my attention because he was like, look, you know, we have offices all over the world. You know, we have offices in the US, we have offices in APAC, we have offices across Europe. And he said, you will travel, you know, with me for a lot of my interviews and prep me. And, you know, you will set up these interviews through the PR agencies, et cetera, et cetera. And I just thought, oh, my God, what an amazing opportunity to travel, you know, and see parts of the world and, and so on. And we did. We literally traveled the world. And it was amazing. For the period of time that it, it lasted, it was an amazing learning curve for me. And, you know, I learned a ton from Fran in, in his position as, as a CEO at that time. So just talking about the contrast at that point in time, you're, you're a marketer, so PR person, yep. Fran Rooney, um, and you were a journalist. So yep. huge pivot, as we said earlier, you know, I mean, a complete, you know, not even an evolution, just a complete Perfect. mega change. Yeah. What were the things that really challenged you in the role, though? Well, you know, it was so new for me. I mean, I had I had done little bits of PR with the, you know, the trade board, you know, writing press releases and, you know, setting up interviews and prepping for interviews and things like that. But this was on a really large scale, you know, and in many different countries. I was managing eight PR agencies across the world at one point. 
you know, and, and basically doing, you know, a large number of interviews, you know, and setting them up every single week. And, and I loved the buzz around that. I was on the other side now because the journalist, you know, I was prepping the journalist and getting, you know, Fran or whomever uh, was was the spokesperson on our side ready for those interviews. But I had a, a really good understanding of how a journalist would approach, you know, an interview. And in most times, I would have preempted the tough question that would come. I would say, you know, they're going to go down the route of this. I know it's not where you want to go. We can either say they can't ask that question or you can go this route. And we would literally come up with scenarios of how to deal with the tough questions. And, you know, I really enjoyed that side of things, kind of preempting what somebody would ask and almost getting ahead of ahead of them. You know, so, yeah, it was hugely exciting. And the travel, I loved seeing the world in that way, even though, you know, people say, well, you don't get to see the countries. It's just the excitement of, you know, you're flying here and there and staying in hotels and just being in big cities around the world. I found that very exciting. I did love to come home, but it was very exciting. There's a great buzz in travel. And even in a business sense, you know, yeah, you're, you're working for most of the day. And, yeah. you know, it is kind of airport or hotels. If you're yeah, meeting. it is. It is that. But there still is this great, for me, what I, I found experience of just even in the taxi, something is different. You see different oh, things. Yeah, and you're looking around you. It's fabulous. A fabulous yeah. experience. You're, well, you're drinking it in as you drive yeah, to the city. That, that's what it is. You're actually you're, you're drinking it in. But it's interesting as well. You made a point that you're on the other side of, of the PR world where you're now briefing the journalists. And yeah. Fran Rooney will be no different than many businesses. The yep. journalists want one question. And yep. you want them to ask a different question. And, you yep. know, sometimes they don't meet in the middle. <laughs> and especially when companies are so successful, as yep. France was. And then, yes. you know, there was the... And the, then the, when the it was project. going south, that yes. was even harder to, to manage from a PR perspective. How do you how do you keep, in that case, Fran or others, but how do you keep or how do you keep yourself now focused on the message? Because it's yep. very easy. I mean, I think Donald Trump's a good example. Yep. What if he goes off script? Yeah, the whole message, and you know he's very qu- competent and highly qualified people writing these scripts. Yeah, and this goes off in the tangent. How yep. do you work to keep people on message, and how do you keep yeah. yourself on message? Unless it was a live interview, I would actually interrupt. Um, so if it was a, I would just interrupt and say, you know, I think we've covered that point. Let's move on, or you know, I, particularly with you know uh, somebody like Fran, you often had to either give him a kick under the table or just deadpan interrupt him and say right we're moving on you know but again if it was a live television interview or a live radio interview you couldn't do that so you know usually it'd be facial expressions you know to you know zip it cut it you know you've said enough and sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't but uh, those are those are the the you know the way you roll with the job it's it's part of it you know it's a fascinating insight you've just given us there you know to, to what happens at, at the highest level in businesses that Yep. That, that many people don't understand, you know, you are representing your company, you are, you know, representing shareholders and, and staff and customers. So you are trying to get the message, you know, out as best as possible. Yep. The interviewer doesn't always want you to get the... Get, oh, for sure. They want a different answer than, yeah. than you're given at times, particularly yep. if, it, if it's a, a, a thorny issue that, you know, that they're challenging your performance mm-hmm. or different things in that sense. Yep. Yeah, and uh, it's you know you talk about facial expressions and you talk about in, in a live sense because I've been in both on both sides of it actually. Yeah. Um, one of the interviewer like like in this and on the other hand be the interviewee. Yes, really hard. You got to really focus on both yeah. sides, and yeah. I just really impressed the fact that you know you 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 use your journalistic obviously qualification yeah. and um, academic experience. Then you use your your experience as a professional and a very successful yeah. Yeah. you know to pivot. And yeah. then that success came out on the other side. That that yeah. really is, to me, very impressive. Where did you go from from Baltimore? What was the next part of your journey? Yeah, I, I continued in. Well, I broadened into uh, uh, wider marketing after PR. I didn't stay in PR after Baltimore. I went to a small e payments company called Network Three Six Five. Yes. Um, they were headed up by a great man, Raymal Pereira. He's a Sri Lankan who lives in Ireland. He married an Irish woman. Uh, I would describe him as one of my mentors for sure. Um, and, and we actually rebranded that company um, as Valista, uh, which was a great experience. Um, and that uh, uh, company was subsequently sold. Um, and I went from there to a company called Jaspersoft, which was a, a business intelligence software company, again, American company. 
and that was bought by Tipco, um, which was a big, big company, um, still going. Um, and they were subsequently bought by Vista, which is a private equity firm. Um, so that was uh, kind of where I was. Uh, that probably took up around nine years between those three companies, Jasper, Soft, Tipco, and then Vista. Um, and then uh, just before Plural Side, it was with a company called Datastax, a data management company, um, and now Plural Side. So in each, in each position, I've elevated either in terms of responsibility or title, which is kind of what drives me, I guess. Okay, so let's let's tease that. Before we get to plural side, because I want to talk about COVID and plural side. So you told us earlier on you want to be number one. Okay. That was that was one of your driving factors. Yeah. And I'm and you know, um, but more importantly, you want to be the best you can be. And yep. I yep. challenge you by saying they the next right don't have to be the same thing. But right. but over your journey, did that understanding become part and parcel of your journey that you know i can be the best they can be yes but i may not be number one and the yes. second point is what were the things that really you saw the big developments for you over those sort of circa nine years you've just taken yeah. us yeah yeah and i i do think that was an important learning curve to realize you can't always be number one <laughs> <laughs> and that it really shouldn't strive to be number one because, you know, you'll be exhausted and you probably won't get there. And then you'll be upset with yourself as you as you go through the journey. So I, I think I readjusted and said, right, I want to be the best that, that I can be. But I also want the, the fundamental thing for me is I have to be happy doing whatever I'm doing. And the minute I become, you know, either dissatisfied or unhappy or disliking the role, that's when I have to go. Right, because I won't be giving a hundred percent, and when I'm not giving a hundred percent, I'm not going to be happy in the role. Um, but I would say one of the biggest jumps in terms of responsibility I took was when uh, Tipco bought JasperSoft. Um, so I was running a media marketing in in JasperSoft, quite a small company, a couple of hundred people. You know, Tipco, a couple of thousand people. And then they gave me all of EMEA for all of their product lines shortly after that acquisition. So. That was huge. It was huge in terms of, you know, the size of the number, the target that I was taking on, the pipeline and billing number that I was was taking on board, the size of my team, you know, grew significantly. So the, the level of responsibility was enormous from where it had been. Um, and I was super excited about that. And I loved that position. Really loved that position, and and then Vista, uh, you know, bought the company, and I held the position for another while. But things sort of changed a little bit with that acquisition, so I moved on. But yeah, it, that was a big leap of faith uh, uh, for me at the time. So let's develop that. So you've gone from a couple of hundred people to a number of thousand people. Yeah, bigger ta- targets, bigger challenges, a bigger team, and yep. more people, you know, coming into you through different avenues. Yeah. What was the biggest strength you brought to that adjustment for yourself? Yeah, I, I, I'm incredibly organized. Um, I would say that's probably one of my biggest strengths. You know, I like to, you know, uh, basically work out the plan and, and have a plan that's very detailed and that everybody in the team can buy into. Um, you know, and, and so I like to very clearly define roles and responsibilities and then make sure that everybody feels part of that plan and are buying into that plan. Um, so it's, it's like, you know, bringing your team on the journey with you. So it's not my plan. It's our plan. And we're all kind of in the same boat, rowing toward the same goal. So I think, you know, the ability to motivate a team and bring them together. Um, you know, I think that is one of my skills. Uh, we had a very disparate team when I when I took over at that point in, in Tipco. You know, there was a lot of silos. People were not working together. They really had no common goals. And, and they didn't feel like a, a team. And so it took a while, but I think we eventually got there. You know, I brought them together. We spent a lot of face time together. So there was a lot of travel in that period for me to get people, you know, to really spend time together and get them on the same page and break down those walls of I just do this bit and I don't care what everybody else does, you know, to just make them feel part of it, part of the bigger thing. And that if one person fails, we all fail. You know, it's not about me and what I'm doing in my little corner. It's about how we're all doing. And we have to help each other to get to that goal. And when we do get to that goal, guess what? We'll all celebrate together and we'll all get our bonuses and we'll all, you know, rejoice in what we've achieved. So, you know, I think that's one of my strengths is bringing people together and aligning them to a common goal. I think it's a brilliant point you made about the the importance of the team because Ultimately, there are teams that, unless we live work on our own, 
we're in part of a team. And the ability to bring a team together, you know, who, who operated in silos previously, who didn't know each other. Uh, I was saying that if you take the word team, together, everyone achieves more. And I talk yeah. to you, and they really do, because it is about the team goal. And we all celebrate. We all do better if the team does well. And maybe yeah. that's from, you know, watching your dad in his world, you know, where, right. where he was a star on the team, you know. And unfortunately, you know, so, so like success was limited, but they had success, particularly yes. in the seventies. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, for sure. His time staying with them. You yeah, did. He also just on that point, sorry to interrupt you, Tim. He also managed the team. He was a player manager yes. for a long period of time. So maybe I, I learned something from him in that regard and, and how he brought the teams together. You know, well, let's let's tease that out a bit, Ivana. So let's just tease that out before we go into plural side. I, I think player manager is a really difficult role. I think yeah. it's you know I think it's a really difficult role because. I, I play sports, so as a player, you look on your teammates from a player's point of view, and you yes. judge them in your own mind and their ability to help the team win or not. That's what you judge them in. Yeah. As a manager, you have to look at them from a completely different perspective. Right? I've got to make all these pieces fit, and I've yes. got to make all these pieces do the best. Hmm. When you're a player manager, you have contradictions because mm -hmm. you're on the field with them at one minute, and you're saying, yeah. oh, my God, Tim is useless. And then on the next minute, you're on the side and saying, oh, I've got to make Tim brilliant. Yeah. How did he deal with it? And what were the things you would have observed that have helped you build yeah. your team focus? Yeah, and I think he would probably say that that was a very tough thing to do. Um, and he probably might even tell you that he wasn't very good at the management side of it. He was good at the, you know, the, the playing side and, and, you know, being in that team scenario. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think people looked up to him and, and they saw what he was contributing and how hard he trained. And I think they, you know, they followed that example to a certain extent. But I wanted to pick up on the point about, you know, the player manager. Um, I have a very specific viewpoint on this one as a manager. Uh, I believe that if you're not in the trenches, you know, getting your hands dirty, that you're not really doing a good job. Now, you can't be in the middle of everything, right? However, you know, I'm known to take on the most menial of tasks. And, and just get my hands dirty to, you know, help the team out. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get involved. I'll start to write stuff. You know, I'll, I'll start to write emails. I'll start to approve landing pages. Just stuff that, you know, maybe a lot of other managers wouldn't be involved in the level of detail. I like to get in there and give the team a dig out when they need it. And to me, I look at that as being the manager who's also a player. Um, and I'm going to challenge that's important. I'm going to challenge you on that, okay? Except you said one very important piece in the middle of it. Give the team a dig out when they need it. So that okay. caveat is very important in my challenge because the, the important thing I, I find for a team is that you, everybody must understand their role in the team. Yes. Okay? And you must make sure that as the manager and the leader of the team, that's very clear and everyone yep. must play their part and let people use their expertise. But there is a niceness for leaders who are prepared when the team needs a dig out yep. to get stuck in rather than sit you know, in, in an aloof position and say, well, that's your world and that's yeah. it. So, and I know, can't touch if it. If you said to me, Tim, well, I do it all the time, I'd, I would probably... No, no, no. no, but no, you, no did, I, but I think it, you did that in the extra line when the team needs a dig out. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to do that every now and again, you know, to show the team that you're not afraid to get in at their level and help out and, and do what's necessary to get us to where we need to be. And, you know, I look at that a little bit as player manager, but to your point, you can't do it all the time. You have to be careful about how much you do that so you're not taking your eye off the ball as a manager. And tell me, then in plural side, you made a point earlier about, you know, that your targets, okay, um, you had a lot of things planned face-to-face. -face. You haven't met your boss. You haven't met so many people in the company. Right. Because four days, you know, before lockdown, you joined. So it was a very challenging time in what we were seeing as normal, you know, introductions into, into companies. But you've obviously delivered a great performance in the year and you, you talked with your team early on very positively and uh, very deeply. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And I do believe there are, you know, there's sunlight coming at the end of the vaccines are coming in and yeah. please go over the next number of months, you know, yeah. that we can get enough vaccines into people and that we will, you know, come out of this and get back to a new normality. Yeah. What are the big things that you had to do in addition to what you talked about earlier with your team during COVID to date? Yeah, there, I, I had to take on a sort of a, a different role in the sense of motivating the team a whole lot more. 
uh, and checking in with them to see how they were doing on a personal level. You know, there's people on my team who live alone, you know, and may not see, uh, you know, anybody from one end of the week to the next. And so I have found that I, I've needed to spend a bit more time with those folks just to make sure they're doing okay. You know, make sure that you're encouraging them to get out. You know, because I think in this pandemic, you know, one of the things that's really important is is exercise, frankly, and, and just making time to get outside and get some fresh air or do whatever kind of workout, you know, it, it takes your fancy. But there were people on my team who were not actually going outside at all. And so, you know, I would I would even just encourage them, I say, I'd say even at lunchtime, you know, walk down to the shop and get your sandwich or whatever you need to do, but go for a walk. It doesn't need to be anything strenuous, but you need to leave the desk that you're sitting at and you need to make some time for yourself. And fresh air is a great thing. Why don't you go down to the park or, you know, whatever was closest to them. And so I spent a lot of time encouraging people to look after themselves and think about that in a more kind of obvious way, you know, and and, and really just make time um, and, and then the other thing was, you know, trying to always have a positive outlook, you know, and I was very mindful of that, you know, like oftentimes in a Monday morning, you might be thinking, I'm finding it hard to lift myself today. But, you know, coming with, you know, look, we'll be out of this lockdown soon enough, you know, hang in there, guys, you know, we've got plenty of work to keep us going. You know, we're lucky that we can work. There's many people who are out of work and, you know, things like that. And, and just trying to spend a bit of time giving people perspective, but also encouraging them to think a little bit more positively and then make that time for themselves. And there was two ways about the time for themselves. It was the exercise piece but I also, and again, this is very much in line with what Pluralsight does, but personal development, you know, use this time to skill up a little bit in an area of technology that you don't know very well. Guess what? We have a platform, you know, with over 7,000 courses and you have free access to it. Use the time, you know, to improve your own knowledge. This is the time to do that, you know, on your Saturday morning or your Sunday afternoon, you know, why not take a course? and see where that takes you. Or, you know, I also made a list of um, uh, positive books that have that I've liked reading, you know, that help with a positive mental state or, you know, the, the growth mindset and, and all of those types of, um, of, of topics. And I just made a list as I was reading them and shared them with the team and encouraged them to think about, you know, reading some of them in the hope that it would help change their mindset if they were going down that negative route. I love the fact that you, you you care for your people during during this pandemic, and you continue to do so because even the little story about going to the shop, you know, for a walk. Because I've talked to many businesses and leaders and say that's critical. We've got to engage and care for our people because it's a tough, not just for the people who are living on their own one bedroom, you know, apartments or you know, just living on their own and have nobody else, but even people who are families. It's still a very difficult and you know time for all of us, and it's we. Caring for people yeah. is something that's so important, yeah. and, and you've demonstrated that. As you look forward, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, you know, we're not seeing the end of this this pandemic just yet. So, you know, the way I look at things, you know, as I said to you, Tim, I try to think of the positive. So, the way I look at the pandemic is, a, it has grounded me in the sense of literally, I'm not traveling anywhere. So, I have four small girls. Well, not so small. They range in age from 13 down to three. Um, and I'm having time with them that I would not normally have. They're here in, during the day. They can wander in and out and we can have a chat. Um, and I'm looking at that as, you know, positive time with them that I would not otherwise have had. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at the pandemic and say it gives me more time with my kids. I'm not running and racing. I'm not off here, there and everywhere during the week. I'm not exhausted at the weekend because I've been traveling. And, you know, my husband and I have more quality time together. We go out for walks, things I never have had time for. So I think from both the personal sense, you know, the, the pandemic, there are some positives in relation to it. And, and that's what I try to hone in on. Plus, I've had more time to really think about, you know, the team and where we want to go in 2021 and, you know, how we're going to mobilize to meet these new, bigger targets that we have to achieve. And I've had also more time, you know, just to think about, you know, the kind of leader that I am and, and things that I need to work on as a leader, you know, and, and I'm trying to address some of those things, you know, through my own personal development. 
Um, but all of these things would never have happened because time wouldn't have allowed, you know, if we continued, you know, post uh, or pre-pandemic because life was a rat race, you know, running and racing. And, and I, I think this time for pause has done us all, you know, a lot of good. That said, I do, I'm spending quite a bit of time thinking about how not to go back to where we were. I don't want to go back to, you know, traveling every other week and, you know, being so exhausted at the weekend and things like that. I would like to have a happy medium where, you know, maybe once a month or once every other month, you know, I might have to travel, but I'm still, you know, uh, really savoring that time with my kids and my husband and, and just coming up with a, a better balance. And I think I would never have taken the time to think about that or pause around that if this hadn't happened. So I think, you know, if there's any positive to come out of all of this, it is that. And I hope that we can maybe not just go back to the madness that was before. Um, well, for me, Ivana, I have to say that from, from being born into a superstars family in, in Sligo, with the desire and the ambition to drive yourself to be the best you can be, to the care and attention that you've shown to people along the way in different aspects, from the time in the Phoenix Park, you know, to people in difficult circumstances, right through your professional career, and now to your team in plural site. I have to say, and that your four girls have now a new superstar. It's not their <laughs> grandfather, it's their mother. It's been a pleasure and a thrill to chat to you. Well, thank, thank you very much for joining the Mindset Shift series. And I look forward to chatting with you again in the future. It was my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching The Mindset Shift. Don't forget to subscribe to get a new episode delivered straight to your inbox. You can do this by following the details below.